Welcome to Jewish Cinematech, where we meet some of the important faces involved with films that tackle aspects of the Jewish experience. Today I am joined by three impressive artists, producer Robert Lantos, director Francois Girard, and composer Howard Shore, who together have created the compelling and truly important film, The Song of Names. Their accomplishments are truly far too many to list. Gentlemen, welcome to Jewish Cinema Tech. It's really a delight to have you join me. Uh, let me just open it up and, and ask the, the tough question. This is a film with Holocaust underpinnings, and yet it's not a film about the Holocaust. Um, let, me, let me turn to you, Robert. I mean, it was your idea. You are the producer. You decided to make this film. How did it evolve, and why were you attracted to it? I cannot take credit for the idea. That was Norman Lebrex, who wrote the novel upon which the film is based. And, it's the, it's, and that is what I read, and what motivated me to want to make this film. Um, <clears throat> as you just put it, it very much touches on the Holocaust, but I would not have wanted to make yet you know another film about the horrors I mean with full of images of, of living skeletons and of uh, uh, of gas chambers so what I what I found um, exciting about about this when I read the book was that it presented an opportunity to to sort of bridge the gap with the past through music and through and, and the, the emotional core of this film is a piece of music which is how the mystery of the central mystery of the story is revealed and I, I was actually resistant to yet again make a film which is on the one hand is the most important story of my life it's, my parents both survived the Holocaust but on the other hand it's it's uh, there it's only, it's only worthwhile if if there's an approach that actually would engage a contemporary audience, and I thought I thought that in that approach existed in this book, and so after reading it, I thought, well, who could actually translate what is on the page uh, into the language of cinema and music simultaneously? And this is where Francois comes in. And so you turn to Francois, who is uh, a fellow Canadian. Uh, why Francois? Well. If you have seen his films, which I'm sure you have, the, the films like The Red Violin, 32 short films about Glenn Gould, and his films about Peter Gabriel and Yo-Yo Ma, this is somebody who's as comfortable in, in both these languages, music and cinema. Francois, you, there are not too many directors who have this sort of, you know, this incredible talent in both worlds. I mean, how did you come to deal with this, uh, this story? Uh, you, you're not Jewish. Initially, the story was about two Jewish families and two Jewish boys. What was that like for you? Well, a great opportunity to learn, uh, uh, as most movies. I, I really see, love my, my, my work for that reason. Uh, each film is a new, you invest yourself into a new world, like whether like at the time of Red Violin, uh, learning about cultural revolution and eventually like surrounding yourself with people who have the knowledge and writers and researchers and then going deep into, uh, did the same thing with Silk with the Meiji restoration in Japan. And, and this is uh, yet, each film has its world, and this one is a that was a very deeply Jewish world, and I had uh, all along great companions, uh, starting with Robert, who brought me from my first uh, visit in the synagogue, he, uh, spent a whole weekend with my keep on and and living the experience, and uh, and to continue with uh, Howard, who was like. Um, brought uh, his own knowledge, but also brought a lot of people who were uh, very knowledgeable and uh, helped us uh, understand the nature of uh, uh, various aspects. And there was a, a lot of uh, uh, consultants and uh, rabbi and, and, and experts. And so... So the original story brought to you by, it was written by Norman Lebrecht. Yeah. And it dealt with... Um, a young man who is a prodigy of sorts. Uh, he's brought by his father from Holland just as the war is about to break out. 
Uh, he's then left with a, a, another family to sort of take care of him, uh, which in the original story was a Jewish family. How did that, you decided to make some changes there? Well, it happened, it's a collective, uh, it happened very naturally and very easy. I don't even remember how, who brought it up, but like we, it came on the table and then at first Robert and I, we resisted because we, for, because we wanted to be, stick to the book, but the, everybody like sort of surrendered to the beauty of the idea, including Norman de Brecht, the author of the book. And, and uh, I think we, it just uh, opened up uh, the, uh, the window. Uh, yeah, when it first came up, it felt like a radical idea. And so we, we thought about it, we debated it, could we do this? And then we actually decided that we would go with that idea. Uh, it didn't turn out to be so radical at all. It was relatively it was, minor changes in the script. Go with the idea that, in fact, TB That the family who, the, who adopts Dovidol, the Polish refugee, is, uh, is not Jewish. It actually is, it drastically shifted the perspectives, but in terms of writing, there was like, it was done in a few hours like this. We changed six or seven lines of dialogues and the, the structure of, the, of the, uh, the script was completely intact. And then you have the relationship between this Polish Jewish boy, Davido, and, and Martin, who he, interestingly, Davido calls him Matol through the rest of the film. But now Martin is, is a non-Jewish character. Did that make it did you connect in some way with either of these well, characters? Well, I, I think it helped me like, uh, as a non-Jewish, and then it helps the non-Jewish audience, because Martin is then therefore placed in a position of discovery. He's like learning uh, about the rituals and the faith, and he's like discovering what it means to be Jewish from a non-Jewish point of view. So like for me, it was uh, exactly the process I was going through. So it, it's, it made my position more comfortable. Uh, but uh, but that was not the reason. Like it was, I wasn't there for comfort. Actually, the it's, making a movie is always a, uh, a battle. Uh, but the, I think it was like just motivated by the openness. Uh, I, we felt that we were uh, opening the door wider to a wider audience, uh, and like it was like true Martin. We were inviting a, a broader a range of. Um, People. There was something else that came out of this once you know we started to adopt the idea, which was that it's a much bigger deal for a Gentile family to adopt a Jewish boy and raise him within the you know within the the, the framework within a Jewish framework. Uh, it's it creates an opportunity to uh, for conflict, for example. You know, this is he, he, no more bacon in the house, um, and uh, he, he has a bar mitzvah, which is organized for him by a gentile family. He gets his first serious violin, the one that is in the film, uh, as a bar mitzvah gift from his adopted father, who's not Jewish. It, it kind of raises the stakes and mm -hmm. creates it created the conflicts that didn't pre that that wouldn't have existed. I also thought it, you know, after, I mean, there wasn't the reason for making this change, but after we did it, that there's something else because, you know, the, it, in this way that the family who adopts him erases him, they sort of become like the righteous of the nations. Um, and uh, if it was a Jewish family, well, they wouldn't be. It would be a more, a more obvious thing. And hence, I'm not going to give away too much of the plot of the film. Please but, don't. But hence, Dovido's, um, let's say, disappearance uh, becomes a far bigger betrayal because he's been True. given so much more by, because those who, those who gave him so much and raised him were not Jewish. And then this crazy thing of music enters the picture. He's a musician. He's a prodigy. Uh, and at this point, Howard, it sort of is in your Ballpark. I mean, what mm -hmm. do you then do? How did you decide to con bring together that Jewish flavor of this Polish Jewish kid from a from a really very traditional family, uh, playing classical music and yet struggling with his own Jewishness? Uh, well, Francois and I had to create uh, the music for the on-screen performances before the shooting, and we spent maybe close to two years, just discussing different aspects of the story, how the music would be used, 
uh, from the early part of the story through the through uh, the end, and I had to write the song of names for the Cantor scene in Stoke Newington, and then the concert scene at the end of the film. And the music is spanning 50 years, so I d there was a lot of research involved, and we had a great collaboration. It was actually fun to work with somebody like Francois, who was so knowledgeable about music and opera, things that I, of course, love. And, uh, you know, bit by bit, bar by bar, I was able to uh, create the piece. Yeah, yeah. Francois, you create, putting on the stage a musical performance is a challenge. Putting on film a musical performance is very difficult to do. And this is something that you've done mm -hmm. in your work. That's right. So what was it like for the two of you to work together? I mean, here you have this amazing composer working with you, and yet you've got to create a situation. There's an audience watching a performance, but there's also a larger audience off screen watching that same performance. Well, the, I would like to say that the, the main challenge, the song is like very central. Like it's the, that song uh, is the center of gravity of not only the soundtrack, but the the narrative. And speaking about music, I think the real challenge was the, uh, the, the song itself, and I, I, I will uh, give all the credits to Howard. We decided together right from the beginning that there would be no cheating, no tricking, uh, that we would use a real cantor. And then Howard went on a journey to dig, uh, a little bit like an archaeologist, dig that song out of uh, the material, and then that took, I would say, probably a year or a year and a half mm -hmm. before, be between the moment we started talking to the moment I heard the first mock-up, it was a year and a half of Howard, uh, you can explain better than me what happened, right. but it was pretty impressive. Uh, that was that was the, our main challenge. And then there's everything else that needs to be done, yes, but the song had to be uh, true, uh, deep, uh, and extraordinary in, at some levels. It, how, in, in Jewish tradition, it's, it's, you know, when you say the memorial prayer, the MLA, which is part of this film, you mention often the names of the different camps. Mm -hmm. But here, it's more than that. It's the names of individuals mm -hmm. who may or may have been lost in, in the Shoah, in the Holocaust. And this is the challenge that you have. It's, it's an incredible challenge. You, how did you delve into that? I mean, you, you spent so much time. Um, I worked with uh, t two uh, great consultants, uh, Bruce Rubin, who's the cantor at the Brooklyn Heights Synagogue, and his wife, Judith Clerman, who's a choral director and a conductor in New York. And they kind of guided me. They showed me where the, where the source lay, where the knowledge was. And uh, my father started a synagogue in Toronto. And in 1951, which is the year of the Stoke Newington scene, the central scene in the film, I was five and I was just t being brought into the synagogue. My bar mitzvah was 59. So the perfect period of the film was exactly when I was immersed in this sound. So I had the sound. I had to go back into the oral tradition, the cantorial uh, tradition to discover uh, my own faith from that period. And uh, somehow, you know, through the research, you feel comfortable at a certain point about making something, but it comes from your heart. And it's, and, and it's sort of, it's a memorial to not just one name lost, but hundreds and hundreds of names. 800,000. Wow. Souls lost in, that in Treblinka. In particular, yeah, in Treblinka, yeah. It's, in Treblinka. Uh, it was 800,000. You went to Treblinka. Now, I mean, I, I don't think there was ever a film that was allowed to be shot in Treblinka, at least certainly not a narrative film. I know that many survivors or children of survivors won't set foot into a concentration camp. Why did you decide to, to film there? I'm actually surprised that we, were, we, we received permission to shoot there, but we did. And it was Francois who first went there and said to me, you know, we, we really have to, we can't duplicate this. We have to get permission to shoot here. And uh, I had never been. And frankly, I wasn't planning on, I'm one of those who never wanted to go. Uh, were it not for this film, I would not have been. Um, but we, 
did get permission. And I think we're the first feature film to shoot there. And, um, and frankly, I don't think you know, it, the film would not be the same if we hadn't actually gone there. Uh, Francois, you make, you make a decision to only allow the person who had direct contact with, with the camps, being the child of the survivor. And, and the non the non child of survivor, the, the, the bystander, the onlooker, you make a very clear point of placing her outside the camp looking in. Was, was that a conscious decision? Well, uh, it came, this whole thing came progressively. First of all, we didn't know what to do with that scene. Like uh, during prep, like all the early stage, we would do read throughs and uh, we knew exactly what to do here, there, and then we would get to that scene and I, I would. Um, sad bar it like just like uh, we needed to uh to go there to figure out w how to film it and then i eventually during we moved to our prep to budapest and then i with the designer francois Seguin, we we went to we took the trip and i was quite reluctant because of everything i had read and like uh, in that week before i went there I, I read more and seen more and like the weight of that aura was uh, weighing on, on my shoulders very much, and then I, I was reluctant that morning. And then we finally went there and lived uh, the experience of two or three hours walking around, and then I knew. Then I knew how to film it, and I knew uh, how to write it. I went back to Jeffrey, and we... Jeffrey was your writer, your screenwriter. Jeff Jeffrey Kane is the screenwriter, and then I said, the, there was a, we had this very talkative scene, and I said, Jeffrey, like, you can't talk. You can't talk there. Like we have, so we erased all of that dialogue, replaced it into other scenes or whatever that was needed. Uh, and the character were like I was when I went there. Like you know, I, we were three of us walking around, and for three hours we didn't exchange one word. So, so that was. Uh, and and then it was also filmed. Like the the filming was a uh, pretty uh, special too. We showed up there in a small team uh, with uh, Magdalena, the actress who plays Anna, and Tim Roth. We uh, it was improvised. Uh, I waited for the sun to uh, show its face, and then we sent the two actors, and we improvised. I followed them on the, with a steady cam, and in and, and it's a remarkable place. I think of all those memorials, it's it's, it's a pretty much a masterpiece, like the the uh, created in the late '60s by three. Um, an architect, an archaeologist, and a, a sculptor, and they created a, 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 an incredible, powerful, uh, incredibly powerful statement. Um, so that's just they created a statement, and Howard, with the music. I mean, the expression. There are no <laughs> words, but that's where the music comes to play. Mm -hmm. And I sat there in my seat. I couldn't move. At first, Howard didn't want to have any music there. Really? Yeah, probably for the same reasons, right? Mm. Like, it's just like, it's, you enter into this highly saturated land, like, uh, and then what do you say, what do you play, what music, I mean, it was probably, I don't know, speak. Yeah, I used the men, there's a quorum of men, a minion, really, of the ten men humming. And then you have Ray Chan, the great virtuoso violinist. You hear his solo violin off in the forest as you see the woods around the memorial. So I, I wrote for for that that sound, the humming and the solo violin. Am I right to, to, to say that it was probably one of the most difficult cues? It was challenging, yes, to make a a statement in that scene, sure. And And also the story that some of the Jews who came into these camps had uh, uh, violins and, uh, and, uh, and music being played for them as they entered their camps and as they were being shuttled off to, to the crematoria. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a break now and, and look at a clip from uh, the film The Song of Names. My dearest brother, from the depths of my soul, I must ask you not to find me. You must think of me now as dead. He is genius. I go back to Warsaw to my wife and daughters. 
If I can find somebody to teach David, I leave him here. I have a family in mind, Mr. Rappaport. My own son is David's age, and I can promise you the tenets of your religion will be fully respected. I don't want you in my room. It is not your choice. Wrong, clever. It is my choice. of this 21-year-old Polish immigrant that one tends to forget how little known his name still is. Did he say where he was going after the rehearsal? He didn't. I'll keep an eye out. Go and find him. I'm looking for David Rappaport. When was the last time you saw him? London. Takes the violin right out of my hands. You never heard nothing like it in your life. They could still be alive. If he wanted to be found, don't you think he would have come to you long ago? Your family? Cursed? I don't know. So music is so central to this film, and you brought in one of the great composers for film that we have. What was your feeling about uh, how music plays in, in, in this work? You've done a number of films dealing with, with Jewish subjects, and yet this is the one with the most music. But because, I mean, this story is really, the entire story hangs on the music. On, it's called the Song of Names, and there is a Song of Names now, but there wasn't one before. It was just referred to in the script and in the book, but it didn't actually exist. And so I've, I've never produced a film that is so entirely dependent on the music. I mean, it was... And it was really, you know, it was uh, Howard working with Francois that, that, that created, through the music of this film, that's the, that's, that's the stallion on which it rides, the entire story rides on it. So I never made a film like that before, and I doubt that I ever will, but this is the, here the music is done, it gives the film not just the wings, which sometimes they say about music on films, but also the heart. So I don't want to give away what that Song of Names is, but still, can you give us a little hint so that the audience can sort of understand what you're referring to? The Song of Names, it just seems so broad stroke. Well, think about, you know, what we, and I, I think at in Mele Rachamim as perhaps a point of reference. Um, it's, we remember the names. We remember. Uh, it's central to who we are, that we never forget. We remember. That's where the song has its point of departure. And, and Francois, you make a point when, they are, when, when he is at the Treblinka camp to focus in on never forget or, or it won't happen again. Never, never, never again. Never again, which... Um, uh, R Robert was with me when we shot this, and uh, like he uh, would not be of Robert, probably I wouldn't have filmed that. And he asked me to turn the camera to that, and it was the right, the right thing to do. Was either. that a statement for today also? Um, I mean, it's a statement for the Holocaust. It's a statement. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Hiroshima. Uh, it's a statement for, I, I guess we were all all of us uh, on a mission of remembrance. Uh, and then uh, I, I think there is a, a, a specificity to the Jewish history, but it's the world history we're talking about. It's the, the, those uh, dark pages uh, from the past that we have collectively have a responsibility to remember. If you don't remember, you repeat. 
uh, and we see uh, we have the living proof today in Europe the you know, far right the rise of those movements and elsewhere and uh, the threats of wars and uh, other genocides I think I think uh, film is uh, a very powerful tool uh, to travel in time and remember and I think all of us here like uh, who, all those who participate in this film and with the actors Clive Tim um, we all felt we were bringing our little share to uh, a big, a big mission that we all share. We have in this film a concert. I won't, I won't give it away. But <laughs> there's a kind of a concert. You know, we love to watch concerts on television. We love to watch concerts on a big screen. This was not just any concert. This was a performance of the Song of Names. Uh, and Howard, this is clearly a pivotal moment in this film. You composed an original piece that is played on the violin by a, 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 an incredible artist. I mean, that was, and it has, you, you hear sort of Jewish motifs throughout it. So can you just hmm. share some, you know, afterwards, having done this, how you felt about that? As well, a Jew, the, the piece is written uh, for uh, th f four voices that you hear in the concert scene: uh, three violins and a cantor. And there's the violin playing in the present reality, and then it's playing two other voices from the past that are pivotal to the story. And then the cant cantor is another voice. Uh, that you hear earlier in, in a scene that's a pivotal scene in the film without giving too much away. Um, I don't know, I mean, I approach music in a kind of intellectual way to start and then an emotional uh, way. So from my heart, I express the ideas that I've come to understand about this story. So as the audience can appreciate, uh, this is a collaborative uh, process filmmaking. I mean, three amazing filmmakers. Very much so. I mean, the, my work wouldn't have existed without working with Robert and Francois. The Song of Names. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you thank for you. having Good us. Good to be here. Thanks. Pleasure. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. And we're especially pleased to remind you that thanks to a generous matching gift from the Cayley family, every new or increased dollar you donate to JBS will be worth double to JBS. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.